So um, you were a student at LMH between 82 and 85, I think. So I'm going to give a synopsis of your career, but, but please forgive me if I get it wrong and interrupt me. Um, so you studied human sciences, which isn't a degree that we offer at LMH at the moment, which I'm sorry about. Um, and um, you then worked in business before studying for an MBA at the Wharton Business School um, at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia two institutions which you share in common. Your early career was spent in the private sector, um, working in and investing in businesses. So you started up the vet chain Companion Care, mm -hmm. which you then sold to Pets at Home in 2002. This all feels very recent to me, actually, but I'm obviously getting old, I think. <laughs> um, and you then, be then be began a property investment business. Um, while I think getting involved in local politics in the Winchester area, mm -hmm. um, and you were elected to Winchester City Council in 1999 and became its deputy leader in 2006, you also stood um, in 2005 as a Conservative Party candidate for Winchester, but were defeated by Lib Dem Mark Oson. And then, in the 2010 general election, you successfully contested the new Meon Valley constituency in Hampshire, winning uh, with a majority of around 12,000, uh, and a majority which you increased steadily uh, in re-election in 2015 and 2017. So that's the background, and I think the part that, that people probably know most about, or you're perhaps best known uh, to my colleagues and, and people here, is that you were a close ally of Theresa May and supported her candidacy for the 2016 Conservative Party election leadership. And you served twice as her parliamentary private sec secretary when she was Home Secretary first between 2012 and 2015, and then as Prime Minister from 2016 to 2018. And the thing that I perhaps hadn't realised actually until you mentioned it um, yesterday was that between 2018 and 2019, you were Minister of State for International Trade in the Department for International Trade. So when Theresa May resigned in 2019, you were knighted in her resignation honours list. Um, and 2019 seems to have been um, a turning point in your career, so some sort of change of heart as you sought new direction. Um, and you've recently been appointed as Her Majesty's Ambassador to the Republic of Cuba, starting in the coming January. Um, and Cuba, I understand, um, you've not yet been able to visit. <laughs> but you are learning Spanish, which is, is very scary, actually. I mean, that you have to sit at Spanish exams. So. So I, I'm very happy to have on stage with me tonight um, Daniel Hussain, um, currently in his first year of a PPE degree, though also here last year as a foundation year student. Um, and Daniel um, has a very keen interest in parliamentary politics uh, and will want to ask some questions. But I'll begin first um, by asking some preliminary questions and then Daniel will take over. Um, and then we'll move on to open questions, uh, taking questions alternately from the floor and from our remote audience. So um, I'd like to begin um, where I've often begun with uh, speakers that we've, we've, we've had here this term, thinking about going back to your life here in LMH um, and how you found it and what life was like at that time. Because I think you must have been one of the you weren't one of the you weren't one of the early one of the earliest of the couples, but fairly well, third or fourth, yeah. Third or fourth. Yeah. Um, and you read human sciences, which I think is a very interesting degree. So so what was it like at back then? I would say I mean I, I haven't spent a great deal of time here since then, that's the, the honest truth. Uh, from the look of the place, from the feel of the students who I've met and seen, from the work I know that Alan's done over the last five, six years. It seems to me it's a lot more diverse. Uh, it seems to me that it is a lot more forward-looking and, and I would say distinctly more modern feeling place than it was when I was here. With goodness me, what it is, I think it's, oh my God, it's about 40 years ago. Uh, so a lot of very, very good work has been done over that time. I, it was in Sila, there's no question about it. I think for those people who are watching this and who sort of aren't yet past 22, 23, it's difficult to remember days without the internet, but there were days without the internet. And you know, it was a very different world. And um, when we said we were going to turn up to a, a, a drink at the Lamb and Flag, we did. <laughs> uh, and that's what we spent a lot of our time doing, socialising in pubs. None of that's changed very much, I'm sure. Playing a, a lot of sport. 
I, but I would say that LMH particularly, we felt slightly stuck in. There is no doubt about that. We were outside uh, the main body of the, of the university. That's how it felt. I don't know how it still feels like that today for students, but it did then. Uh, and I won't pretend it was exciting every moment of the day, because it, it wasn't. We had an awful lot of work to do. So human sciences is, I think, an absolutely fabulous degree. It set me up to do all sorts of things that I never imagined I was being set up to do. It's an incredibly wide, wide degree, but it did mean that we had to think in a lot of ways creatively a lot of the time and be in a lot of departments learning lots of different things across a very wide gamut. And for that, we ended up with an awful lot more work, I think, that, than some students did. Now, I'm not pretending that every degree at Oxford isn't very hard work, because I know full well it is. But because we were stretched between so many faculties, it, it became really quite difficult uh, to keep up. So we had lots and lots of work to do. But I love my time here. I met some great people. Um, but my most treasured part of it was, was the degree, what I did, mm. um, mostly because it was so diffuse and it took me to so many different areas. So, so can I just ask why you chose human sciences? That is and, a, and can you tell people actually what it was? Well, okay, so, do it, so. so it's, it's, it's basically, it was explained to me at the time as a, as a, a PPE for scientists, uh, which I don't think is exactly right, but it, it's, it's quite close. I don't know how many people know the HSPS degree at, at Cambridge, mm. most recently put together. That is very like that, perhaps a little less Arcanant and a little more sociology and philosophy, but that's, that's roughly where we were uh, on that front. Um, I did a lot of demography, I did some zoology and animal behavior, I did some human, uh, human anthropology, I did lots and lots of social anthropology, that's where I ended up uh, specializing mostly. And funnily enough, my daughter ended up doing HSPS at, uh, at Newnham in Cambridge, and so we had a lot to talk about. Though I have to say, so social anthropology has moved on so far, it's barely recognizable from when I was doing it. And it's that part of the degree that I carried with me and still carry with me today. I, I do think Social anthropology particularly teaches you to look at people and systems and the way people live and work and interrelate in a very different way than any other degree. It, it's, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, sub subject, and I would encourage more people to do it. So a good background for politics, is that basically? Possibly. So, so why then, did you think about going into further research or, or, or what led you into business? Can you explain the steps that you took after you were here as an undergraduate? Yes, um, and first of all, um, the career path, I think, was, I won't say it was more set in those days, but there was a definite route through. There was the milk round. I'm yeah. sure the milk round still exists. But it, the milk round was simply, if it didn't and doesn't, if it doesn't exist now, the milk round was basically every large company in the UK would come and offer jobs at Oxford and Cambridge. It was pretty standard. Not many other universities got the same look in. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I'm pretty sure it was the wrong way of doing things, but it's the way it was. Uh, and for most of us, that was the way we looked forward. We, we were looking at banking, we were looking at large consumer products companies, law firms. You, you can imagine roughly the same sorts of things people look at today, I'm sure, but they all came to Oxford and Cambridge and we, you know, we all applied to, to a plethora of them. For me, um, banking is what I was looking at at the time. I applied to a company then called Robert Fleming & Co, mostly based in Hong Kong. Uh, it was eventually bought by J.P. Morgan uh, and is now part of that huge behemoth. Um, I didn't last there terribly long. It turned out that finance and I weren't terribly well matched. So, so you then went into business. You did so things. not immediately. So went off to do uh, an MBA uh, after that. The truth is I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do or how I wanted to get on. I had no particularly concrete uh, thoughts in my head. I knew that I didn't want to do any more finance. Um, my family had been entrepreneurs, and so that looked attractive to me. Uh, I have to say that had I known more about entrepreneurship and had been involved at more at grassroots level for longer, actually I would have worked out that an MBA wasn't the right thing to do to be an entrepreneur. You're far better off going uh, and working for a small company and learning that way. Uh, but nevertheless, th that's where I went, uh, and I applied to four or five American business schools, and Wharton offered me a place. That's why I ended up there. No one else did. <laughs> So you, you said to me yesterday that you that business schools were, were good at some level, but they weren't. They only taught you how to be successful, or they tried to. And one of the things that you said was um, that 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 what they really needed to do was to teach you how to fail. And what would a course in failure look like? So I wonder why you said that. What, what does that mean? Well, so, I mean, I think a lot of what you get out of business school is a large toolbox. Um, it's very difficult to remember what you didn't know before you started somewhere. And I didn't know my wife, who I met there, which was one of the best things I picked up, that's for sure. Uh, but 
in truth, what you pick up is a large toolbox that you don't even know you've got because you didn't know what you had beforehand. Uh, and it tends to be manufactured or put together around the sort of tools you need in consulting all large companies of one sort or another. There was a, an entrepreneurial major program at Wharton, and it was very good. They taught us an awful lot of stuff that you need to analyze an opportunity, work out what risk rates are, work out how you can project forwards and, make, you know, and, and sell your business to funders and so on and so forth. But the simple fact of the matter is that entrepreneurism is, is, is a completely and utterly different way of doing business than doing a mainstream business, particularly consulting or banking, which is where lots and lots of Wharton grads, grads end up. And one of the things you need to learn as an entrepreneur, and it's now so much better known because so many young people go into it these days, but to learn how to fail, to regenerate, to learn what you've done wrong and make it right next time or the next iteration is an incredibly valuable skill. And it took me two or three iterations to begin to learn what I was doing wrong. And actually what I was doing wrong more than anything else was I'm just a lousy businessman. I mean, I, actually, I just worked out that I wasn't really very good at running businesses. I was very good at coming up with ideas. Uh, there have been about three or four people who've gone on to make m some hundreds of millions and some billions of pounds of, of, from ideas which I started, uh, but which I was incapable of, of, of delivering, which is one of the reasons I changed, I changed track. Um, but that learning from failure is, an is something that I think everybody should get some element of in, in their educational lives. There is a lot to be learned from where things go wrong. And most of us do absorb something from it. I'm just not sure all of us absorb everything from it we should, particularly the opportunity it presents to improve and make yourself better. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, actually. And one of the, one of the things that I often notice with students, that we're, especially these days, that when you come to Oxford, you're very geared towards success. And it's built into the way that we think about ourselves, you know. Um, and, and, of course, there will come a time in life where you do fail. And how you adjust to failing or not doing as well as you'd like and picking yourself up and learning from it and starting again is one of the great lessons in life. But, but it doesn't come easily in the culture that we, that we exist in, I think, these days. Well, I think, as you see, and particularly mm. for people who have been perpetually successful, yeah. particularly in academics, which doesn't always translate particularly well into real life, there, there is, at some stage, it is almost certainly going to go wrong. There are very, very, very few people who never feel the pang of, of failure in their lives. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Now it's interesting that that you then went into local politics, and I'm I'm curious about that because I I have friends who've um, actually spent their lives in in uh, be, being city being local councillors in 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 rural areas and so forth. I, I wondered what made you do that. I mean, you 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 were deputy leader of Winchester City Council, and, and did you do that with a view to going into? Um, another kind of politics afterwards or, or did you did you do that out of a sense of civic duty or, or just because you like doing it well the, the 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 first reason i got involved is because somebody wanted to change the town where i live in a way i didn't really want to happen and so i got involved in a campaign to stop a supermarket being built just outside the, the boundaries of the town which i thought was going to suck most of the commercial life out of the middle of the town in fact I'm, i know it would have done and i got involved in that campaign and we were successful we stopped the supermarket, I mean, well, we stopped the land being, being sold because uh, the person who was selling it was a local person and we put enough pressure on this person so that it didn't happen. After that, I was approached, as you wouldn't be terribly surprised to know, to join the parish council, actually, in fact, my, in our case, a town council. And I thought, well, actually, do you know what? I, I really ought to do that. I've now got a bit of time. I'm not quite so busy with, with, with work as I was. Why don't I do that for a year or two and, and actually learn a bit about the public sector, which at that time I knew woefully little about is the, is the real truth. And so from one, one hand, I thought, I need to know more about this. I need to know how the schools work, how the boards of governors work. I need to know how they're funded. I need to know uh, much more about the, work, the way the world works. And at the same time, I do need to put a bit back. I mean, I love this town that we live in. And actually, it's right that people who've got the qualifications and the time and the, and the energy should put something in. So I said, fine, I'll join the town council. Well, within about six weeks, I was deputy leader of the town council. Uh, and within about six months, I was chairman of the town council because nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> Uh, and then I was approached by local political parties, would I like to join because, you know, you're an active person and so on and so forth. I was approached by the Liberal Democrats first and, and they, they as, who are very good at, at encouraging people who are interested in getting involved in, in their politics. Uh, and I said, well, I'm, I'm a, actually, I'm a conservative by, by inclination. And they said, well, you'll never get, a, you'll never get elected around here. 
oh, I said. <laughs> and then I made the mistake of, of, of uh, joining the local conservative party and standing as a local conservative councillor and then getting elected to do that. Uh, and then I, I encouraged quite a few local people to get involved in, let's just say that I was by far and away the youngest person in the conservative party locally. And I persuaded quite a lot of people to get involved, including a very charismatic chap called George Beckett, who'd, been, uh, said, who'd stood as a, um, an independent candidate before was very, very charismatic, had led a blues band, local garden centre owner, and he, would very, he was very keen to be leader, and so we put together a scheme whereby he would be leader and I, I would be deputy. And so and that's how that evolved. Daniel, would you like to take over? First, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Ellen Mitch is honoured to have you. Um, my first question is, prior to you becoming a Member of Parliament, you founded and operated several businesses, including a renewable design company, how do you think your business experience aided in you being an MP? Now that's a very interesting question. And funnily enough, it's a question that I used to get asked a lot as a member of parliament, which is, why don't we have more people involved in, uh, who've been involved in business in running the country? Because obviously it's the same thing. Well, it really isn't. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Can you learn anything from business that qualifies you to be a member of parliament, that sets you up to, to be a member of parliament? And I think the answer is yes. You can, uh, you can learn to be organized. You can learn to see opportunities. You can learn to see things and analyze them in a different way. At the same time, where, the way I always explained it was, would you really want someone to design and build a house for you who wasn't an architect or at least reasonably qualified in architecture? And I think the answer is no. And I actually want my politicians to have lots of experience in politics because it's a very, very particular world. And you have to learn a level of patience in politics that you never have to deal with in, in business unless you're involved in the largest possible businesses. So most people in business are deeply impatient. They want change all the time. They want results quickly. And if you're in charge of the business, if you're the CEO or the finance director or a, a large shareholder, you can force change. You can make it happen. You, you simply change your decisions on, a, 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 on a, a, a 5p piece and turn and go the other direction. You can't do that in politics. And for most people, people in business, they just run out of patience. They can't deal with the glacial speed at which this stuff moves. Now, it moves at a glacial speed for very good reason. You're spending somebody else's money, and very often money that people don't want to give you, quite, re you know, quite reasonably quite often. And therefore, you've got to look at it incredibly carefully, and you've got to take time and make sure you're spending the money properly. And you have to put it through the ringer endless numbers of times and wash it and look at it again and start again and think again to get these decisions right. And you don't always get them right. But it is fundamentally different from politics, uh, from sorry, from business. And, and I, I, I think you can do both, but the, the floor is littered with people who've come out of business and senior roles, gone into politics, and it really hasn't worked for them. That's uh, incredibly interesting. Um, my second question is, one of the roles you had as an MP was being a parliamentary private secretary, uh, or PPS. And um, one of those has been a prime, uh, the PPS, the prime minister. As PPS, you're often seen as the eyes and ears, and you were the eyes of, and ears during the Brexit negotiations. So hearing what the backbenchers were saying and you trying to articulate a message to the backbenchers, what kind of things were you trying to say and why do you think it didn't necessarily get across? So there's a bit of a conflict. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most people aren't particularly au fait with the different levels of, of roles uh, in Parliament. So let's just do a little moment on that, otherwise we can get quite confused. A PPS is at the very lowest rung of the ministerial ladder. It's the first thing you get appointed to if you're likely or you're being told by the party that you're, you've got prospects, you're going to move on. So as the PPS, uh, there, there, there's an, a, a very wide range of PPSs. I think there's 44 or 45 of them now. There used to be one for each office, great office of state. So we're only about only five. There'd, be, there'd have been one for the prime minister, one for foreign secretary, one for defense, one for home, and whatever the other one is, which I forget at the moment. Now there are 45. So almost every minister ha has a, a PPS. So it's not quite what it used to be. But you are very much the bag carrier. That You have no executive power. You're not taking any... Um, uh, you, you can't give any instructions to any civil servant, you're not taking any decisions, you're not part of any decision-making structure. Being the PPS to the Prime Minister is slightly different in that you do represent the Prime Minister in and around Parliament and you, people know that you have a conduit straight into the Prime Minister and that is worth a lot to, to quite a lot of people, so you have a degree of power in, in that regard. 
just remind me of the central core of the question, otherwise I'm going to ramble. Um, I guess basically, what kind of message were you trying to articulate to the backbenchers? Oh, on Brexit, okay, so the problem we had at Brexit was that, that in the end there is a conflict, this is where I was going, there's a conflict between the role of the PPS and the role of the whips. So the whips are there to enforce party discipline. The PPS is there to channel opinion backwards and forwards from their principal, and in the case of the Prime Minister, the principal is the Prime Minister, in which case it's, it's kind of like being one of the whips. You are articulating what the Prime Minister thinks. And of course, the problem that Theresa had was that she didn't have a majority, and she, you know, and she did have a majority and then, and then threw it away. Um, it isn't quite that simple, and actually, funnily enough, I do think that having that general election was the right idea at the time, and it's interesting to reflect that Boris Johnson in 2019 only scored one and a half percentage points more across the country than she did in the, in the 2017 election. They were just in different places. So this, this conflict between the whips and, and the PPS is, is fairly profound. And it means that at a time when there's no majority, you can only wield so much influence as the PPS because the prime minister doesn't have control. And the prime minister, prime minister doesn't have control. You as the representative of the PPS, uh, at the PPS is, is going to be taken not less seriously, but that conduit directly in is not going to be quite the same. So I was present at a lot of meetings of the different factions. I was in the room on a regular basis when there were private meetings being held between those on the Brexit side and those on the Remain side. I was endlessly involved in the private negotiations trying to get people to compromise between those two groups and to come to some sort of agreement about how we could make this all work. But the truth is, in those days, in those particular years, those year, year or two, it was so confused and so difficult, uh, and there was so little control available to anybody that pretending you were do, have, you were being deeply effective uh, would, I think, demonstrate more self-illusion than anything else. <laughs> and um, it's particularly interesting uh, regarding your thoughts around the 2017 election. So you, you said it was the right decision, but I guess afterwards it probably wasn't the right decision for Theresa May. What were your thoughts around the 2017 election? What do you think could have been better about the campaign? And yeah, just your general thoughts. I, that, that for me, that's a reasonably straightforward question to answer. I, th I think with the right campaign, the result would have been a great deal better. And I think Boris Johnson managed to show in 2019, there was a majority out there to be had, but we had in Jeremy Corbyn, a relatively new leader of the opposition who was not yet widely understood, I think by a lot of people, that was very different two years later. Theresa's biggest mistake by any stretch of the imagination was that she did she ceded control of what the campaign would be, particularly about her, to professionals rather than controlling it herself. And she is a very particular politician. She appears outwardly to be grey, dull, slightly one-dimensional, uh, and I can tell you that none of this is true. She is a delightful person who has a great sense of humour, but you need to be very close to her. She doesn't make friends easily. And she's not your prototypical politician. She doesn't, she's not very clubbable. She, she needs to know you very, very well. Had she promoted herself as an alternative to Merkel, for example, and, and that sort of alternative, the mother of the country who would take us through this difficulty, who is, who is strong and stable, yes. You remember that one? Mm. <laughs> but actually meant it and could demonstrate it on the stump by being not the world's most exciting orator, but a very steady hand, I think that, if, I think that the, the, the outcome would have been different. A key part, however, would also have been a, a standing on the heads of the people writing the manifesto who ought to have recognized that this was a deeply unstable time and not the moment to start throwing out wildly interesting policies which were also very, very difficult to sell, particularly to conservative voters. Not a great recipe uh, for a general election. One of the great things I've learned about being at Oxford the past year, which I'm sure you experienced, is the ability to meet people from all across the world. Yeah, um, one thing I've seen in the past year is a certain political apathy that we just spoke about previously. Um, I guess, w w why do you think we, got, we have gotten to this state in politics? And how do we change it? like kind of the disconnection between constituent MPs and their constituents, just in, just in general? I think this is really interesting. Now, I've been, out, I've been out of politics now long enough. Two years is long enough to lose touch. But, but it seems to me that most people have never been more political, not, not in my lifetime at least. Uh, no, people have rarely cared as much about what is going on around them, certainly during the referendum, and I think otherwise too. And it seems to me the levels of energy involved in younger people at the moment are at an all-time high. 
I, I could never, I mean, the, the surgeries I held in the latter part of my career in politics, there were far more younger people coming up to talk to me about climate change and about social issues, the state of our prisons and all sorts of, than had ever been the case in the previous five or 10 years. So I'm not quite sure. I think there is a very, there's also a very close, a close relationship between MPs and their constituents. Strangely, I think there I would contradict you. I mean, look, when David Amos was killed, his constituents were plainly very heavily engaged with him. And I'd like to think, you know, I, I was nothing like David Amos and his level of connection. He'd been there a long time and worked incredibly hard in his constituency. But I like to think when I left my, my post, most people in my constituency knew who I was. And I'd spent every single Saturday I was out there having, doing a surgery. Anybody could talk to me anytime, and lots of people did. So, and I don't think I'm even slightly unusual. Lots and lots and lots of MPs have a very close connection with their constituents. But I think there's a real disconnect between politicians and parliament and the people, mm. and what people see parliament doing and, and what it, it, how it operates. And the more that is revealed by the machinations, for example, around Brexit and what the previous speaker was doing and so on, the less connected people feel to it. It looks like a very foreign land to which most people feel no connection whatever and feel their people feel, I think, that things are being done to them rather than for them or on their behalf. Well, I, I guess one of the criticisms would probably be the lobbying scandal, the, the, the lobbying scandal that's um, <laughs> taken place recently. Um, so, for example, the parliamentary standard watchdog found that um, Owen Peterson, yeah, Peterson, um, broke paid lobbying rules, yet Conservative MPs initially voted against his, his suspension. If you were in Parliament, how would you have voted and what changes do you think need to be made so that things like this just don't happen again? Because I don't think this represents what a Parliament should be, quite frankly. Look, I, I, I'm... I looked at Wednesday's events and I knew a little about what was coming up. I have so still good friends in Parliament and I just looked on aghast. I mean, it's morally wrong, absolutely no question about it. But apart from that, it's the most mortifyingly stupid politics. And I just for the moment, I looked at this and I went, what on earth does the Chief Whip, Mark Spencer, who I know very well, think he's doing? How is it that this has ended up as a whipped vote where Conservative MPs are being told that they may not vote for the right side of this argument. An argument which is brought, being brought by a, a group of, well, we can call them senior, but if we mean older um, pol politicians, who frankly, I don't think carry much of the Conservative Party with them, who around a gentleman who I don't have much, I don't have a lot of knowledge about Owen Patterson, I know him as much as I know some other parla parliamentarians, which is not a lot, but it seems pretty clear to me that he was lobbying on behalf of a company while still an MP in the heart of government. That cannot be right. Uh, and we, there's no question that it was a huge error of judgment. And frankly, the mere fact that they, 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 did it, they turned on a sixpence on Thursday says to me that there was something plainly and absolutely wrong with it from the very first get-go. And I have no idea what they've been drinking that morning, but that plainly they shouldn't have been. Um, how do I think the rules should change? I, to come back to your, the first question you asked me about the, re the relationship between work and parliament and do business people make good parliamentarians? I do think it's important that we shouldn't cut off parliament completely from the real world. So should parliamentarians be able to work at the same time as being in politics? And my simple answer is yes. I, I just don't see there is a good reason for that not happening. It was always the case previously. One of the reasons parliament sits at such peculiar hours is because people used to work and then go to parliament. And I think we want widely qualified people who've seen a lot of the world, who understand how different parts of the economy work, who've worked as trade union reps, who've worked in prisons, who've, do, who've worked in large companies. I think we want all those people represented in parliament. And I think we want them to stay current. What we don't want is them lobbying on behalf of anybody. So as long as we have a transparent register that says where people's interests lie, if they are required to recuse themselves from debates where they have an absolutely clear direct interest in the result of that legislation, if they are absolutely not allowed to lobby on behalf of any company in any way in, in the inside of government at all, then I think we have a reasonably sensible system. We've got to be able to accommodate the ability to have a life outside parliament, because if we do, we'll have a poorer place. But at the moment, the rules are plainly not strong. Thank you for that. Um, I recently read a book um, 
why do uh, uh, yeah just one book i'm at oxford so it's very difficult to find some free time but the book was called why do we get the wrong politicians which kind of systematically details from even selecting an mp to getting to the top why we're not necessarily getting the, the wrong politicians the clues in the name um but um w one thing that i quite strongly saw was how difficult it is to get into the political political sphere like on average they calculate they cost about twenty thousand pounds to even run, let alone win, due to like the time taken out of work and stuff. What kind of things would you recommend if for, for like if someone wanted to go into politics to go into in the future? Do you think systematic changes need to be made so politics becomes more inclusive? <clears throat> and uh, to, yes, to the latter part of your question, but I don't think that's that's the same issue. Mm. And we should clearly all seek to have a parliament that reflects the country in which we live better than it currently does. And that particularly means more women, uh, but it also means more people from um, other racial backgrounds other than, than, than English and, and white. So there's just no doubt about that. Uh, at the same time, I, I think we need to be very careful to understand that we do live in a democracy and that the democracy is a highly imperfect thing. Uh, and we are bound always to have discrepancies in parliament in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and there are some people who are so keen on being politicians that they will always find their way there, whether we want them to or not, whether they represent the wider population or not. There will always be people we would love to be there who aren't. Uh, and I am not sure that there is a mechanism I can think of that will allow us to control that a great deal better than we currently do if we're going to live in a society that's open and free, where we aren't trying to force people into, 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 into different roles. The alternative, it seems to me, is not a dictatorship, but it, it, if we try and... The, on, the only alternative is to have very large-scale state funding. That means if you choose a track to go into politics, you can afford to do so because it's basically paid for by the taxpayer. I just don't think that's the right way forwards. If a party has a sufficiently wide appeal, it should be able to fund itself. It should set its own rules about how it recruits people. Those should be in accordance with any existing laws on diversity and so on and so forth, obviously. But at the same time, if we try and codify this uh, in a way that is so absolute that you are fixing things, you're going to end up with no better result in the end, is, is my view. Interesting. Um, and I understand you've, you've recently been appointed as Her Majesty's ab ambassador to Cuba. Um, why did you accept such a role? And what is your kind of focus during your um, tenure? Okay, just <clears throat> it's important just to, just to note this. I'm actually the ambassador designate. Um, it's one of those rather strange peculiarities that you not only can there only be one ambassador at any, any one time, neither I nor my predecessor can be in the country at the same time. Otherwise, <clears throat> otherwise we, we are there to represent the government and the Queen, actually, is who we're representing. And clearly, the, there's not allowed to be any confusion about who might be in post. Um, why did I say yes? Um, I think the answer to that is who wouldn't? That's the kind of the way I look at it. If somebody approaches you and says, say, would you like to be a, an ambassador representing the United Kingdom on the international stage? Um, I, I, would, I would end up, frankly, in the Pitcairn Islands. Um, and, and who wouldn't want to represent the UK in Cuba? One of the most enduringly fascinating places on the planet with an extraordinary history, an amazing last 60 or 70 years, huge challenges to meet, a place where Britain can and should have more influence than it currently does have where its near neighbor is a very, very close ally of ours, and we therefore have a relationship, even if it's by proxy, that, that we must look after and nurture, uh, it seems to me to be an enormous privilege. And apart from anything else, it's quite close to where my wife's family is, and, um, and she speaks Spanish as well. <laughs> so there seem to me to be all sorts of fantastic reasons to do that. Uh, in terms of what I want to do when I'm in Cuba, and I think that's something that I have to be slightly careful about at this stage, I have a relationship to develop with the Cuban government before anything else, and I think it would be arrogant of me to walk in and say, I know what's needed in Cuba before I have even set foot in the country. Um, human rights are, of course, extremely important, uh, and it's pretty plain that Cuba is going through a very challenging set of times at the moment, uh, and there are two or three ways in which the, company, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 the country could jump, and it would be fascinating to see which way it does jump. Um, so very interesting times coming up, but I don't think I should be sufficiently arrogant at this stage to say that I know... Uh, what I will do because I simply don't yet know enough. I'd just like to chip in at this point or leap in. Um, 
some people would say that coming from a political background, you know, that it's an unusual step to take to go into diplomacy at this stage in your career. Um, but we did talk a little bit about this uh, earlier on. And could, could we explain what it is that you've done in the past which you feel equips you very well for this particular role? So I think that, that comes in, in two or three parts, actually. Um, first of all, business helps. Now, actually, in Cuba, there is very little in the way of, for, of, of interest for British business at the moment because it is not a, a, a country in which there are any real business prospects. But I think as, as a, a former business person working in, in, in the real business world, that's a useful skill to have. I think probably the most useful skill I've had is as a PPS uh, in Parliament endlessly trying to create relationships between people, us understanding the web of relationships behind certain groups, interpreting all of that for the prime minister, making suggestions about how relationships can be used in certain ways to unlock certain features and certain opinions, to bring people on board. To certain, that all seems to me to be the stuff of diplomacy. It's actually just the stuff of raw politics, but it's, it's the stuff of diplomacy particularly. And then finally, as a minister, I was the minister for uh, trade policy. In 2018 to 2019, and was responsible for putting together the UK's, um, well, whole of its trade policy because we didn't have a trade policy because we hadn't needed one for 45 years. It had all been left out, left to the EU. Plainly, we had trade interests, but we didn't didn't have to have any of the mechanics that you need as an independent nation sitting at the WTO, with all your um, levels of tariffs uh, and rules of origin and so on and so forth. There's a huge world of complexity that sits behind all of that and we didn't have any of that. We didn't have a trade remedies authority, uh, which is the body that sits and says, is someone dumping something unfairly in your markets and do, can we therefore impose extra tariffs and so on and so forth. And all of that required me to spend an awful lot of time abroad talking to an awful lot of governments about an awful lot of stuff um, that was to Britain's benefit. And that of course is again also what an ambassador does. Um, so I think that in those three ways, I have experience to bring to bear. What I don't have is the experience of the formality of being an ambassador. Uh, and that's not just about how you treat royalty or how you treat the president when you go and meet them. There are all sorts of bits of formal training that are required to be a good ambassador. For example, how to run a crisis. Now, you may say, well, what do you mean run a crisis? Isn't the very definition of crisis that you're not running it? Well, the fact is to deal with a crisis effectively, say a hurricane of which... Cuba sees a great many. You need to know exactly which, which uh, levers to pull, exactly who to call. You need to know how to structure your entire organization to deal with that, deal with all the Brits sitting on the ground in Cuba, make sure they're safe, make sure they've got fr access to water, that they're constantly looked after, and so on. So there's all that training to go on top. And I don't belittle for a moment the skill set that lots of our uh, diplomats have, and particularly on that sort of front, the formal training front. But there is a risk, as there is in any organization with only one fount of staff, that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and that there is a way of doing things and these things never get challenged. And I believe, and actually even the Foreign Office believes, that there is a role for outsiders to come in and do some of these jobs. And I'm very honored to be one of the first to come in from the outside for some time. That's, that's really interesting. And I was thinking about protocols that you need to learn for dealing with emergencies and those sorts of situations. Uh, is that something rather like you're learning Spanish, which actually you have to undertake before you go out, or, or, or do you do it when you're on, on the job? As it no, were? very much so. I, I actually spent three days in crisis management training, going through endless exercises, real time, real emergencies. I have to say, um, we had a, a couple uh, on, on live TV who'd, who'd, who'd lost their, these were actors, who'd lost their child and trying to deal with them, trying to calm them down, and so on and so forth. I mean, to, to the point where they had me in tears. I mean, it was it was it was very emotional. And then you have to you have to be able to regulate yourself. You have to make sure that you're efficient in front of your team. You have to make sure that you're taking dispassionate decisions that involve the least harm or the most good, rather than the absolute thing that's sitting right in front of you. There's all sorts of skill sets to learn that is not easily learned. Uh, and I suspect when and if a crisis comes, I will be actually very reliant on some of my solid um, lifers. Uh, uh, to, to make sure those structures will work properly. Um, with, I, I won't have that training and it will be very necessary to have them around me. Well, that's, that's really interesting to hear actually. So you've, you've led such a, an active and sort of packed life and you're obviously always challenging yourself with new things. What do you do to wind down? I mean, how do you, how do you switch off from these things? Uh, Jeanette's now gonna get 
very bored because I'm going to talk about fishing. <laughs> uh, I do I do all sorts of things. I love gardening. I, I love we 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 have a garden we opened up to the public every now and then. You know, just uh, the National Garden Scheme, as many thousands of people do around the country. Um, I love photography. Um, I, I I love um, I say nature. Actually, the Spanish have a better way of saying it's naturaleza, which takes in a bit more than that. And it, it's um, so I love taxonomy. I love I love to know what plants are called and what, what they're related to, and 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 same with animals and so on. But I particularly love fishing, uh, and I, and I, I I fish a lot, and I fish all over the world, and have done for years. And it's it's one of those things that is completely and utterly diverting. You cannot think about anything else when you're doing it, uh, and that is I, something for all of you here, the the older and the younger. The older people have found their things that don't do that for them. But if you are here at Oxford and you're a student, the odds are you're going to be a very busy professional and probably very successful person. And I would very, very strongly advise you to find something that turns your head off. Something where you cannot think about anything else other than what you're doing right now. And it usually involves something that's got nothing to do with, with, with the rest of your life. Very sound advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I think we'll open the floor up to questions. So, um, I think we'll begin by seeing if anybody in our audience here, in our live audience, has a question for Sir George. Um, and then we'll turn on to... Um, uh, I'm, just to be clear, I'm very comfortable with George. <laughs> oh. I like to be deferential. Um, uh, so, questions. Yes, please. Uh, I was just wondering, given your past experience with uh, trade policies, what do you think about like dumping and tariffs and that sort of stuff? Because the way I see dumping is a foreign country subsidizing local consumption, which means local... Consumers can buy goods at a cheaper level. Um, and so I, I, I wonder what you think about tariffs and trade barriers and bilateral trade treaties and that sort of stuff. Well, there's a complicated subject. So let's just take the example, for example. I, I think, okay, so Chinese policy on steel. Um, the problem for most international producers of steel is that particularly in China, but elsewhere too, it's not a, just a Chinese thing. Energy is very, very substantially subsidized. And because energy is very substantially subsidized, the price of steel is produced at a much lower rate than it is elsewhere. The whole idea of the international trade system is that it should set a rules-based approach to how we trade with each other. And that should seek to eliminate artificial subsidy for any particular industry as much as it can, given the circumstance. If you don't do that, you simply get sectors that are dominated by people who subsidize the most. And if you do that, you're not getting any competition, and you don't get that uh, there isn't a level playing field. And in the end, that one country will, will simply end up with all the production uh, in their backyard. And that can't be right for anybody. It can't be right for employees, particularly in those countries that can't compete with that, where the subsidy isn't available. It isn't right for consumers, because in the end, it's not sustainable, because there is no way that you can carry, subsidizing, uh, carry on subsidizing that way. And even if you did, most countries that ended up with a monopoly of that sort at the end of having eliminated all the competition is going to use that monopoly position to increase prices anyway. So it's not even sustainable in that way. So I think one of the most remarkable international achievements of the last 50 to 70 years is actually the WTO and the international trade system. To have found agreement between all of those countries to allow countries to trade on an, a level playing field with each other seems to me to have been an astonishing achievement, only evidenced more by the fact that there's been literally no progress at all since 1995 when that was put together in making steps down, further down that road, which just tells you how enormous the success was in 95 when that all came together. <clears throat> uh, if we believe in a globalized world and if we believe in the might of wealth creation to spread itself around the world by trade, and there are plenty of people who don't believe in that, and I absolutely respect those views. I had lots of lobbyists, lots of uh, charitable organizations coming to see me as the minister saying that, that this is simply a subsidy for the, for the West, uh, that is exporting pollution, that is exporting poverty, and so I, and I, I spend a lot of time talking with them because I think they have a point. But if you believe that globalization on the whole is a good thing and that it spreads wealth widely, and it is a fact, that over a billion people have been lifted out of absolute poverty uh, since the WTO uh, came into existence in 1995, specifically through the policies that were allowed by the WTO, then the trade system is the way to do it. Globalization, in my view, therefore, is, is a good thing because it, it helps more people 
uh, in, than, than were being held before. And to do that, you need to have rules about anti-dumping and you need to have rules uh, about what you can and cannot do within the realms of the WTO. Yeah, we've got a question from Alice online. Um, she says, what is your view on the promises made at COP26 conference so far? Have leaders of industrialized countries gone far enough? Okay, so first, I think the first thing I'd say is that I would be lying if I told you I knew every decision that had been taken at COP26, or even a great many of them. But my impression from a distance, having just come out for three weeks immersion in, in Mexico doing my language training, is that too many of the largest polluters were not there and not making commitments. Now, I know that Brazil has made some pretty wide-ranging commitments, so particularly on deforestation, but Bolsonaro was not at uh, COP26. Mm. President Xi was not at COP26. President Putin was not at COP26. I don't think, incidentally, this was a failure of diplomacy. I don't think it was a failure of the UK government to, um, to run an efficient and sensible version of, uh, of COP26. I just think that we are at a period of international tension right now, um, particularly around trade, but around many other things as well, where it was always going to be an extraordinary ask to get the right people around the table to make the right decisions. Even with a progressive in the, on the seat of the president in the United States, the commitment from the United States has also been relatively lukewarm, uh, to coin a phrase. Uh, and so it was always going to be a very hard time to get enormous progress made. And I think that is probably evidenced by most of what we've seen. So questions from the audience, please. Joe. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, in terms of pol international policy, English collaboration with well, Cuba, particularly in, in Latin America, um, do you feel that there are any prospects for health collaboration with the Cuban government, that, since that's one of their main foreign policies at the moment, with the UK? So yes, uh, the Cuban business plan for the UK is that there should be more cooperation on health policy, absolutely. Um, even in my position, I'm not, uh, I am not close enough to be able to tell you exactly what those are. This is, these are the documents which I'm not, not at liberty to share, but one of our pillars is that we should particularly be cooperating on the biotech space, because as you know, the, the Cuba has a very vibrant uh, biotech industry. Of all the industries in which Cuba ha has a presence, biotech is undoubtedly the most interesting in, in the international space. And the UK is reasonably closely involved uh, in, in biotech in, in Cuba, and I think there's more to do on that front. The most interesting thing, I think, though, about Cuban health policy is the exportation uh, of Cuban health policy, which has replaced the Fidel era exportation of war, which is, you know, or revolution, with uh, the exportation of doctors. There are far more doctors trained in, in Cuba than can possibly be, be used by the system for, frankly, in the end, lack of resource to be able to, to use doctors properly in Cuba. And uh, a great many of them work throughout Latin America, as I'm sure you know well. Uh, however, it has been really quite controversial as a policy, and President Bolsonaro, again back to him, uh, in, in Brazil, actually shut down the program, as I'm sure you know. Um, and he shut it down because he described it as a form of modern slavery, which is an interesting description. But in essence, what Cuba does is it sends its doctors overseas, it charges a certain amount as the government to its, its partner governments, in this case uh, to the Brazilian government, for the provision of those doctors. The standard wage which the doctor would be paid in Cuba, which at the time was $25 a month, uh, was retained by the doctors in, in, in their host nation. Uh, and the rest went back to the government of, of Cuba, which I can see why someone might, might consider that to be a, an exploitation of labor in a way that is not entirely right. So this is not without its controversy. Uh, and I, I do think that, that Cuba is coming to a time when they're, they're going to have to think rather, caref rather more carefully about how they carry on their medical diplomacy. Rebecca has asked online, what do you think are the most important attributes for a successful political career? Now that is a very interesting question. And I think the answer to it actually has to be different people, different strokes, different folk for different strokes. Uh, I think a level of determination is absolutely essential. And we talked a little uh, about how difficult it is to become a selected candidate in a seat uh, that is winnable. 
So that it takes an awful lot of doing, and it requires some financial backing. There is no doubt, or at least flexibility from your employer, or if not that, a sufficiently high wage that you can afford to take some unpaid time off, whatever it is. So fortitude and dedication is, is undoubtedly required. I think there is another route in, which is where you start at the very bottom. You start at the age of 18 or 19 or 20, working for one of the political parties, and you are an apparatchik, as, as, you know, as I think the, the papers would call them, and you will work your way through that way. And whatever it is you're doing, you're still intimately connected, and probably your employer knows this, and it might well be one of the reasons that they've taken you on. You might be George Osborne or David Cameron, and you've got a role at Carlton Communications, or you're working for a hedge fund. They know who you are, they know you're moving ahead, uh, and so on. So, an investment in, in self at that age, in, in how you might get ahead. I would say it's invaluable to be reasonably in, in wealth, in wealthily, uh, wealthily independent, that you've done enough so far, you've, you've uh, started a company, you've been involved in a startup, you have worked as a, as a banker for a lawyer for 15 or 20 years, and you've got enough behind you not to have to rely on anybody's largesse for you to take independent decisions of your own mind when you want to and how you want to. And you're not going to define your success as being a minister because you're being paid more money. You're going to define your success about being your own person in politics uh, and making decisions on the basis of what you think is right. I think those, those things are all important. For me, the reason that I attach myself so firmly to Theresa May is because she was one of those people who I just knew at any given time, whatever the pressure on her personally, however difficult it was for her in terms of her reputation as a politician, she would always put the country first and herself and her career second. And I think we need more people like that. And I just wish there were more of them. Unfortunately, those people tend, tend to end up on the back benches. I'm afraid is the truth of the matter. One of my very best friends in politics is a chap called oh, Sir Charles Walker, Charlie Walker who is just as honest as the day is long, but it makes him an awkward sod on an awful lot of occasions, and so has done nothing for his career as a minister. At the same time, he's been an extremely effective backbencher and championed all sorts of things, uh, particularly to do with mental health, which is something that he, he has some issues with as well. So lots of different palettes from which to, see, to, to, to find your colors and to draw your picture. Um, I think it can take all sorts of different people. I, don't, I can't make one particular prescription, but just always be honest with yourself first uh, and worry second about what other people might think, particularly the party. Thank you very much. Um, questions, further questions? So just kind of uh, going back to the kind of Cuba issue, um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were, if you had any on the uh, kind of recent protests and kind of ongoing protests uh, in Cuba against the government, and uh, if these kind of protests kind of escalate, uh, what role do you see uh, for Britain uh, in potentially kind of facilitating democratization in Cuba? Well, that's a fascinating question, and it sits at the very heart of what's so fantastic about becoming the ambassador to, to Cuba in, in the next um, month or two. I, I think, the more I thought about, sat and thought about this, the more I think it, we, we are in the proce a process here that is absolutely, at an absolutely uncontrolled stage. And several things have contributed to this, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward so much to learning more. But I think the key figure in all of this has been Raul Castro. Now, I come to this as a complete novitiate, and I've learned a lot, but I have talked, and I've talked to quite a few people, but this is just my head telling me this. The, the, the changes that we've seen in the Constitution and in the control of the party seem to me to have Raoul's fingerprints all over them. I think he is, it'd be a huge mistake to call him a liberal, but there's absolutely no doubt that he recognizes that change is required. And I think of, he very carefully set out to create a succession which was clearly not connected with the old regime, that didn't have any of its legitimacy, no connection back to the early days of the revolution. He very clearly picked somebody who is not a great orator, who is not a great character, but is somebody you can trust to deliver a package. He very carefully designed a change in the constitution, which undoubtedly changed the way Cuba is going to work. It has now been put on the books by plebiscite. It is there, it is a fact. Most recently, in the last week, I think last week or the week before, bits of the Constitution that required a change in the rule of law and of trial uh, and of detention and habeas corpus and so on were actually incorporated by decree into, into Cuban law that, so that now we have a situation that is not wildly different to, inter, to, inter, to international norms. Post 
July the 11th, the behavior certainly wasn't anything like international norms. So we shall see now what happens on, set to, on, on November the 15th. Was it the 20th? Or is it, who knows <laughs> uh, what's gonna happen on that front. The part, the part that I think also that, that Raoul also clearly in, engineered was the birth of the internet uh, in, in Cuba, which had been very heavily controlled up, and, up until um, very recently, but it was quite clear that it was his decision to actually bring it forward as well. So we have the new constitution, we have the internet, uh, and we have Ra um, um, Diaz-Canel, all, all of which say to me that Raoul for a long time has recognized that the old model is unsustainable and has to change. And whilst it's never going to be Vietnam or China, it has to look more towards the market. And then you have all the rules that are changed in the, in the constitution about small business and about a list of businesses that are prohibited to be done by the private sector rather than the ones that are allowed. And that is a massive change as well. Suddenly, all sorts of things can be done which couldn't have been done before. <clears throat> the problem that occurred was basically the change of leadership in the United States in 2016. And on top of that, the crowning glory, or rather the, the final blow, was, was COVID. And the massive fall in revenues from tourism, which meant that the economy simply couldn't cope anymore. And unleashed a huge wave, wave of discontent across the economy. Combined with the, with, the, with, the, with the collapsing of the two currencies into one, meant a massive blow, uh, explosion in inflation, huge uh, problems with getting anything in the shops, most people not being able to afford anything anyway, all the dollar shops still existing and creating the, the contrast, and all of this stuff through that very carefully managed package off beam. And now we're in this uncontrolled phase where I think it, it might have just marched ever so slowly towards a more market-based system we're now at a point where we're gonna find out who's actually in charge. Is it the old guard along with the army or is it the reformers? Uh, and I don't think any of us knows the answer to that and I don't think they know the answer in Cuba either. I think we need to be finishing off now actually, unless there's one, if you've got one last question there. Okay, um, well it's Alice again, she's already had a question, <laughs> but um, she has said, you are the founder of the renewable design company Rendesco. What do you think are the key challenges the renewable sector are facing at the moment in the UK? So Renewable Design Company and, and Rendesco installed very large scale heat pumps, mostly for sheltered accommodation for older people. So we, we, we installed heat pumps for nothing, for companies like McCarthy and Stone. Anybody under the age of 40 will never have heard of McCarthy and Stone. Everybody over the age of 40 has shares in them. <laughs> uh, we installed the heat pumps in their car parks and underneath their buildings and the, the heat converter in, in downstairs. Uh, and then we charge for putting the radiators in and so on. But we took the subsidy for 20 years and we, in effect, it was a project finance arbitrage. We could install this stuff and get a return off the, the subsidy uh, if we did it correctly. And actually that's what the government wants. They want the, the government wants more volume, more volume, and more volume to get the cost down. Just like in solar panels, where after about four years in solar panels, the, the price had dropped sufficiently, there was no need for any subsidy anymore. Um, it was, it, we sold it um, two, two years ago. Uh, I'm very pleased we did it. Um, it's definitely, it's still the biggest in the industry by some distance, and that's a problem because it's not, not a very large company and we need a massive capacity to fulfill the government's targets of heat pumps replacing uh, gas boilers. It seems to me that in the medium term, the massive problem that is domestic heating uh, in the UK, which I think is about 20% of all emissions is represented by domestic heating, can only be solved practically by putting something in our pipes to run our gas boilers, and it's almost certain to be hydrogen. But then of course you've got to worry about green hydrogen and you've got to worry about carbon capture and storage and that's all extremely challenging as well. So the 2030 and 2050 targets are all well and fine, but there are a great many um, difficulties to be dealt with in between times. And if we are simply creating more pollution by producing the, the hydrogen than we are by saving, but by burning the gas, then, then there's no point in going ahead anyway. Uh, and to do that, you are going to have to do carbon capture and storage, and we are still at the infancy of, of that. I don't see ground source heat pumps being the answer on the whole. Uh, we have too many terraced houses and too many large cities to be able to find the capacity to heat the water through that method. Um, so th it is in the end, it's going to be a replacement for natural gas in the boilers that currently exist. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you ever so much. Um, so I think we, we, must, we must wrap up now. And it just remains for me to thank George, 
not Sir George, George, um, for, for, for such a really stimulating, wide-ranging um, conversation tonight. And thank you too, uh, Daniel, for, for, for joining me on, on stage at quite late notice, actually, something that we only put together last night at our drinks party. So um, th thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.